You are listening to The Loop Podcast, a project in plastic surgery innovation. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. I am Dr. Sanam Zahidi, and today's episode is a resident in service review of the ear. This is a supplementary episode and not a comprehensive review. This is a breakdown of key points from previous examinations that may help if you're studying for boards or in service. I have here with me today Dr. Morgan Martin, our co founder, and her sexy voice. <laughs> so damn, you know I have laryngitis. Be nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then let's talk about anatomy first in our discussion, anatomy and embryology. The ear is formed from six helixes that come from the first and second brachial arch. The first brachial arch gives off the anterior helix is number one, two, and three. That gives rise to the tragus, root of the helix, and superior helix. The second brachial arch gives off the posterior helixes, numbers 4, 5, and 6, that give rise to the antitragus, the antihelix, and the lobule. Now moving on to anatomy. Morgan, can you tell us about the blood supply to the ear? Sure. First, the dominant blood supply to the ear is the posterior auricular artery, and this supplies the anterior and posterior surface of the ear. Again, this is the dominant blood supply, and we also have some minor blood supply from the superficial temporal artery, and only a small branch of this artery supplies the ear, and it crosses the superior helix to supply blood to the triangular fossa, which is the lateral portion of the ear. Another minor contribution to the ear is the occipital artery, and it supplies, again, the posterior ear. So it's very important to mention the posterior auricular artery plus the superficial temporal artery are both branches of the external carotid artery. Now, Sanam, what is the innervation of the ear? Well, there's four nerves to think about in this region. The first one is the greater auricular nerve. It supplies the lower lateral and inferior surface of the ear. Moving on up, it's the auriculotemporal nerve. It supplies sensation to the anterior and cranial surface of the ear, the crease of the helix, and the tragus. The next one is the lesser occipital nerve, and it's sensation to the superior cranial surface of the ear. And lastly, there's Arnold's nerve. It's an auricular branch of the vagus nerve. That provides sensation to the concha and the area surrounding the external auditory canal. So if a patient gets a ring block around their ear, which as the name implies, the patient is getting local anesthetic circumferentially around the ear, this isn't going to anesthetize that Arnold's nerve unless you go inside of the conchal board to get to it. Now, Morgan, can you tell us about ear measurements? Yes, the normal adult ear is about 5.5 to 6 centimeters in length and 3 to 4 centimeters in height. You'll commonly hear the head to rim measurement with regards to the ear, and that refers to the distance between the posterior auricular skin and the helical rim. Normal ranges for the head to rim measurement are at the helix, 10 to 12 millimeters, at the middle of the ear, 16 to 18 millimeters, and at the lobule, 20 to 22 millimeters. Great. So since you brought up the measurements, let's talk a little bit about congenital ear anomalies and prominent ear before we dive into the discussion about ear reconstruction. And let's start off the conversation with cryptosia or pocket ear. It's common among Asians. With this anomaly, the upper part of the ear is adherent to the scalp. So the cartilage is there, but the superior helical rim and scapha is buried under the skin in a pocket where the name comes from, basically, pocket ear. So because the ear cartilage is there and it's just buried, when you place the ear under traction, the upper pole cartilage all of a sudden becomes visible. This deformity is caused by an anomaly of the intrinsic oblique and transverse auricular muscles, and they love to test this part. Surgical treatment requires release from the pocket and resurfacing of that posterior retroauricular defect. Next is stall ear. The most prominent feature in stall ear is an abnormal third cruise of the antihelix. There's also flattening of the helix and posterior superior projection of the helical rim. Treatment includes wedge excision, and they usually have enough local cartilage to use a graft to create a normal ear. So, Sanam, I always remember this because it looks like the Spock ear or the elf ear. So, you will commonly hear people refer to the stall ear like the elf ear. Oh, that's good. I hadn't heard that one. Moving on to microtia. It's an ear deformity that has a range of abnormalities from a hypoplastic ear to a completely absent ear. 
or to just a small ear with normal morphology. So because of this, there's four grades. In grade one, you have a mostly normal ear. It's just smaller compared to the other side. In grade two, you have some recognizable anatomy. In grade three, you have a small rudiment of soft tissue and no ear canal. That's really important. So what distinguishes grade two and grade three is that there's no ear canal in grade three. And in grade four, there's absolutely no external ear and no ear canal. It's most commonly unilateral, seen in males, and it affects the right ear. It can be associated with syndromes like golden haar and tissier number seven. Most of the non-syndromic microtias will have formed inner ears with some hearing. It's important to note bilateral microtia patients with conductive hearing loss are often candidates for bone-anchored hearing aids. But it's really important to note that they need to have their ear reconstruction done first and then have the hearing aid placed because the hearing aid placed first is going to mess with the reconstruction. And don't forget workup for patients would include audiometric testing, which is testing for conductive and sensorineural hearing. There's three routes for surgical treatment. First is autologous rib cartilage. Second is to use a implant such as a MedPOR implant. And third is to use an osseointegrated prosthesis. So now let's look at them individually. So we talked about the first one being autologous rib cartilage. There's been multiple descriptions with a variety of stages described by Dr. Tanzer, Dr. Brent, and Dr. Nagata. Dr. Tanzer originally described this operation in 1958, and he broke it down into six stages. Dr. Brent then advocated for starting the repair at about age four to six, and he broke it down into four stages. And his four stages included, in stage one, the ear framework is fabricated from the contralateral ear and it's placed in a subcutaneous pocket. In stage two, the lobule transposition rotation is done. In stage three, there's projection that's created by elevating the ear construct with full thickness skin grafts and banked cartilage. And in the final stage, stage four, the tragus is reconstructed and conchal is deepened if it needs to be. Now, Dr. Nagata advocated for repairing at age about 10 to 12 years old, and he combined Dr. Brent's stages to create a only two-stage operation. So in his, in stage one, you have a rib cartilage frame that's made using rib six to nine. It's placed in the subcutaneous pocket, but now he also did the tragal reconstruction and the lobular transposition. It was done at the same time. So all of that is stage one. In stage two, he elevated the ear construct with a temporoparietal fascia flap and new placement, obviously, of cartilage graft. Critics cite that with this technique, there's scar and alopecia with the use of the TPF flap, and there's also donor site pain and scar when you're trying to get the second costal cartilage graft. So to simplify what I just said, Tanzer is six stages, Brent combined a few of them and made four stages, and Nagata just basically said two stages. The second route of microtia repair is described by Dr. Reinisch by using a microporous high-density polyethylene implant, which is the MedPore implant. It requires a temporoparietal fascia flap. There's a high learning curve associated with it, and there's also a high extrusion rate with this method. And the last route of repair, which we will just mention, is the use of osseointegrated prosthesis. Now moving on to the next ear deformity, let's talk about prominent ears. With this, you see widening of the conchal mastoid angle, usually more than 150 degrees, and absence of the antihelical fold and deep conchal bowls. So you're mostly corrected with non-surgical ear molding starting at three days old. And this is because higher postpartum circulating maternal estrogen is present in the baby's blood, which increases hyaluronic acid, which is a key component of ear cartilage which is what causes the ear cartilage to temporarily be malleable enough for us to be able to mold it. The timing is important because the maternal estrogen peaks when the baby's three days old, and then it returns to baseline at six weeks, which is why early molding is so important. Now, Morgan, what's the most common complication of ear molding? Okay, that would be skin ulceration. And this is always a question, and of course, we want to start the ear molding early and as you said, three days is optimal, but you can still do it if the baby presents at, say, like a week old. Now, if surgery is required, wait for full development around age six to seven. 
The most common cause is loss of antihelical fold. So to repair it, a mastardi suture is placed between the scapha cartilage and concha cartilage to recreate the antihelical fold. The second most common cause is conchal hypertrophy. And to repair that, perform a conchal setback. That's when you fixate the conchal cartilage to the mastoid fascia. If you do too much, the ears appear pinned back. And if too close to the EAC or the external auditory canal, you can obstruct that auditory canal. Okay, great. Good points. Now let's focus on reconstructing acquired ear deformities. Now that's whether you had trauma or tumors. And just like any other part in the body, the main question to answer first is what's missing? Is it the skin only or is it the skin and the framework, in this case, the cartilage? So partial thickness ear defects, which entails just skin loss with perichondrium and cartilage intact, just like anywhere else in the body, if you have just partial skin loss, you reconstruct it with a skin graft. For full thickness ear defects, in cases of the ear, a full thickness defect is skin and cartilage that's gone. The management depends on the location of the ear and the size of the defect, and we'll break this down a little bit more. A few points before we get into individual defects. First of all, small evolved ear pieces, such as those that are less than 1.5 centimeters that are from a clean cut injury, should be reattached within six hours as a composite graft, especially in children. Second, for total ear replants, it's been shown that ears have good outcomes even if at the time of microanastomosis, you can't find a vein to anastomose. So you just go ahead and replant the ear with just the artery and use leech therapy post-op. So that's crazy to me to think that you can replant an ear and not find a vein and it still works, but it does. Just use the leech. Oh, you know that's my favorite thing to use. <laughs> oh, yeah. So next, burn wounds to the ear should be treated with sulfamylon, which is methanide acetate. So this is a cream application, and then you use a non-compressive dressing. So this is actually really hard for me to remember. So if you remember from a previous episode, methanide acetate, remember MA, metabolic acidosis. So that's a testable question. And you use sulfamylon because the ear is cartilage. And like I said, these are so hard for me to remember. So something that I like to think of, now you have to use your imagination because this is a bit of a stretch, but sulfamylon, my ear on. So I think of my ear with sulfamylon to remember that is used on the ear. All right, so next ear hematoma, it's important to treat immediately with hematoma evacuation and a compressive bolster dressing to prevent cauliflower ear. And this forms from subperichondrial hematoma surrounding devascularized cartilage, and that results in fibrosis. Great. Thanks, Morgan. Those are actually all great points. Going back to what I was mentioning about the acquired ear defects, we talked about how the type of treatment for a full thickness defect depends on the size of the lesion and the location. So let's break that down a little bit more. So for conchal bowl or scapha defects, if the skin is just missing, you can either let it heal by secondary intention, or you can do a full thickness skin graft if the perichondrium is intact. For full thickness defect, meaning that there's no cartilage present, then you can use a posterior auricular pedicle flap, otherwise known as a flip-flop or revolving door flap. And I really encourage you guys to look at the YouTube video for this flap because it makes sense. What you're doing is you're taking the posterior auricular scalp skin and you're bringing it out from behind the ear, inside, into the conchal bowl, bringing it out into the defect to recreate that bowl. Now let's break down the ear into thirds. Anytime you're going to talk about ear recon, that's going to be the first thing that you think of. Superior third, middle third, or inferior third. Where's the defect? So for superior third, if the defect is less than one and a half centimeters, you can just perform a wedge resection and do primary closure. You're probably thinking if you already have a defect, what are you talking about when you are talking about a wedge resection? It's already, you know, there's a defect there. But basically, in order to bring the two edges of the helix together, you want to create a little pie. Think of the pie and the crust is where the actual helix would end up because that'll make the ear nicely close apart next to each other. So that's what they're talking about when they say take out a wedge. For defects one and a half to two centimeters, you can perform a chondrocutaneous helical advancement flap, or another name for that is the Anita Buck technique. 
Whereas the name implies, you make cuts along the helix to allow advancement of both cranial and caudal helical chondrocutaneous flaps. And then for defects more than two and a half centimeters, you should consider a posterior auricular or preauricular interpolated tube flap. So moving on to the middle third ear defects. So this is the same as the superior third, but I will reiterate. So less than 1.5 centimeters, again, wedge resection plus primary closure. Then one and a half to two and a half centimeter defects, you can do a contracutaneous advancement flap and greater than two and a half centimeters, the posterior auricular flap. And I actually did a middle ear defect closure last week using the Anita Bush technique, and it was so much fun. And it's one of those things that just technically is really fun to do. And without the knowledge of how to do the contracutaneous advancement, this defect would seem really challenging, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And this is one of the reasons why I love plastics. So shout out to Dr. Chang for a really fun educational case. Moving on to the lower one-third defects or lobule defects, they're usually easier to reconstruct because of pliability and laxity. So up to 50% of the earlobe may be removed by wedge resection with only minimal deformity. Now, if you have to do a total earlobe reconstruction, then it's important to use composite graft for structure, even though, as we all know, the earlobes that you're born with don't have cartilage in it. Since we're talking about ears and earlobes, I just want to bring up one last ear defect that's related to facelift surgery. So really, it's not in the reconstruction category, but it's the only other thing that we can get tested on potentially with regards to the ear. And basically, a pixie ear is a pulled or tethered earlobe that appears attached to the side of the cheeks rather than free hanging. So it can develop after facelift surgery when the surgeon removes too much skin. So the skin then is struggling to cover the face. Instead of there being a nice space between the earlobe and the actual cheek, the facelift skin actually pulls tension on the earlobe and it causes it to have that tethered look. Yeah, that's not a good look, is it? (laughs) No. All right, everyone, this concludes our episode. And thanks for listening to our quick and non-comprehensive review of the ear. If you like our podcast, please spread the word, tell a friend, like us on Facebook, watch us on YouTube, and follow us on Instagram at The Loop Podcast. Also, if you're on the Clubhouse app, join us every Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific for our brunch talks to get in the loop.